I'm a real world Challenger business jet captain and former airline pilot. Any procedures or techniques I discuss with you today are strictly for flight simulator use only and for our entertainment. Always consult a professional flight instructor for flying lessons. Welcome back to Foxtrot Alpha Aviation. I'm your host, Rob Hammer. Well, today we are back in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Charlie Yankee Whiskey Golf. And I just wanted to show you a little bit around the airport itself. It's a fairly large airport. And if we zoom in here a little bit, we can see this is where we're going to be at 17 wing. Our aircraft is located right here. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. This is the main terminal area. And this is one of the FBO areas. And there's another one up here. Um, I normally use this, F this FBO down here. Um, in order to get into this FBO though, we come off the main street and we pass a number of really cool gate guards. This is one of the neatest ones I've seen in Canada. So we have a Beechcraft Musketeer here. We have a Grumman Tracker. We have a Bell Kiowa down here. And we have a beautiful F-104 Starfighter in uh, Europe livery. Awesome. CF-101 Voodoo, one of my favorite aircraft. A lot of inspirational stuff when I was a kid, um, including being flown over by three afterburning CF-101s over top of my head on top of uh, a place where I lived in British Columbia. Very memorable. Uh, the T-33 Suit Shooting Star, the F-86 Sabre, and the CF-100 Canuck. And beside that is the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan Memorial there with the uh, Harvard. So that's really cool. I just wanted to let you know 17 Wing has been here since 1925 and uh, basically it was part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan which you can check out yourself. I just wanted to let you know I was not part of the RCAF or part of the Canadian Armed Forces. I was an Air Cadet Officer and what you're looking at here right now is part of the Royal Canadian Air Cadet Leave of Canada's website and just showing you a glider takeoff. I was a glider pilot um, scholarship recipient back in 1989 and completed my training at CFB Penhold near Red Deer, Alberta. Really awesome organization for youth in Canada. Uh, it's been around since 1941. And if you're interested in air cadets and you're from Canada, it's an absolutely incredible organization. And hey, if you work real hard and you're selected, you may become a power pilot or a glider pilot. Well, that's enough about me. We're going to head right into the operations center. Well, today we're in a bit of a different, uh, different looking FBO. And I haven't really started off in, in, in an FBO before, but today's FBO was created by Aerodynamics. And I just want to say thank you very much for your awesome uh, work. We're just going to have a little bit of a stroll over to uh, this uh, area here. We're at the 412 Operations uh, FBO. Now, we're not exactly at that facility, but uh, we're just going to have a look at this. This is absolutely incredible. So the high flight by pilot officer John Gillespie McGee Jr. And uh, you can read it yourself, but this is pretty special. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things. You have not dreamed of wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence hovering there i've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft along through fitless halls of air up up the long delirious burning sky i've topped the wind-swept heights with easy grace where never lark nor eagle flew and where with silent lifting mind i've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touch the face of God. Well, thank you very much for that aerodynamics. That's really awesome. And uh, for you that fly, this means a lot. And for you that don't fly, I'm sure it means a lot for you as well, because it just gives you the incredible feeling of flying without even leaving uh, your chair. Absolutely incredible. Thanks for that. And um, we'll just have another look around. As you know, I'm not an awesome, um, 
person with uh, moving around. But here we go. This is the uh, the pilot officer John Gillespie McGee Jr. Annex Eight Wing. We're not actually at Eight Wing, but that's okay. So what we've done is we've come into our operations center here, and we have determined through our um, our discussion with our maintenance department that uh, Europe One tail number 101642 is ready to go for a test flight so we're going to head out to the ramp here and we've already had a look at the weather today here in winnipeg and uh you, you can see our beautiful europe one is uh looking pretty good they've done a lot of work to it and as you know uh, we've had some pretty big issues with our CF-34 engines, but we've been assured that everything's all good to go. So we'll have a quick walk around here. So our crew's already removed all of the covers and pins. Got the pins out of here, both sides looking great. It's the 26th day, 1600 Zulu, 040 at 3 knots, variable 340 to 080 degrees, 15 miles visibility, few 25,000 temperatures minus three altimeters three zero four seven so an absolutely you know a little bit of a crisp day but we love that here in Canada so let's jump into our beautiful 10 let's put that back off there we go let's let's jump into the aircraft here so just like in real life one of the first things we want to do is when we get in the aircraft is make sure it is in the state that we want it to be now this aircraft's been through heavy maintenance and you know things get moved around and you can't assume that the last crew put things to where you want it to so let's head up to the overhead panel now what i would encourage you to do is start at the top and just kind of have a, a a look at each button and each put push button now the one that i always get mixed up is the apu so if i look at the apu i can push in the button and i should see it depress and that and that looks pretty good so if I go um, up into the corner here, depress it, I can see that, that, that it's flush and that's what I want. So that button is pushed out. Now the start stop button, this is a culprit as well. To me, it looks like it's pushed in and it was. So that's an issue. So you wanna make sure you got those out of the way. So just starting from the top, this is off. All the gens are off. All our hydraulic pumps are off. Look at the lights kind of where we want them some people leave the nav light on and that's a safety thing and if you want to do that that's cool so we'll leave we'll we'll leave that on i think that's a good idea <clears throat> up to the top here making sure nothing's pushed in having looking at each switch as we come down here these could be culprits as well we'll have a look that's pushed out that's pushed out okay so there we go. So we found lots of little issues here now. So let's look up to the top here. This is a pretty major one to be, you know, pushed in and pushed out. So we want this one to be pushed out. That's pushed in. That's pushed out. Okay, 14th stage is another one that kind of gets mixed around. So 14th stage, these normally live in the left and right 14th stage in the pushed in position. So that's out and that's in okay so those are good the isolation should be pushed out now 10th stage these should be all out that's in that's out in out there's out in out okay cows that all looks good so we've had a good look at everything here we could turn these off if we wanted to. We want to make sure this is off. This could be an issue right now because we actually could be, um, our emergency lights might be on right now and that would be a problem. We'd have to look at uh, replacing a battery and that kind of thing. So let's go back to here. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the Challenger 650 QRC or the Quick Reference Card. Now I think I've mentioned this before, every company does things differently and i've had people say you know rob hammer you shouldn't be doing it this way or whatever whatever it may be and you know i i don't mind that um those comments but understand that every company does things differently so if i look at 
um, a, a certain procedure a certain way, you may say, well, no, I don't do it that way. Well, and that's fine. But I'm going to use the actual Bombard J QRC. What I'm trying to get at is that some companies memorize things. So, for example, um, my company wants all of the QRC memory items to be memorized. So when I did the APU fire uh, example not too long ago, I was doing everything uh, by memory. So, uh, you know, with an APU fire, we've talked about this before, it's going to be APU fire push, press in. So where is that located? So I've got my APU fire right over here. It's not super convenient for the left hand side, but remember this aircraft is designed to be flown with two crew. So I realize we don't fly it with two crew in flight simulator, but that's what we're simulating. Okay, so the APU fire push, we press in. Okay, we press that in. And then we can do our own timing or set a timer after five seconds after the, the APU fire light stays on so that we would have APU fire here then we're going to press the APU bottle arm switch. So when we press this button, remember a whole bunch of things happen. And um, I won't go over them all right now, but a series of things happen like fuel solenoids get shut off. And, and if it's the engines, we get pneumatics, electrical, all of those systems get turned off. Um, this also arms the APU bottle and basically what it's doing is arming the squib so it's ready to be fired the next thing is press and hold to discharge so when we press this um, first wait our five seconds then we're going to have our armed light come on underneath here and we're going to press that and then that is the memory items complete for that particular qrc item the next thing we would do to is proceed to another section called apu 01-1 which is not memorized. So what I'm going to do is a number of things in this next few videos. I'm going to basically cover off all of the engine malfunctions. So I'm going to cover off uh, anything to do with the engine, whether it be a hot start, a hung start, or some other type of malfunction that we have during an engine start. So these would be fairly quick little videos, but just a quick introduction. The aircrafts come through heavy maintenance, We've gone through, we've done an external walk around to the best of our abilities, knowing that our, our maintenance department has done a proper uh, maintenance inspection of the aircraft, and we're happy with that. Uh, I also want to cover, make sure that you've gone through these. I've just found these thrust reversers that are armed. So again, go through the entire flight deck. Have a look at every single switch this is not okay so the ground crew has left all this stuff on and you know we can't fault them for that because you know they've they've done their job and they got the airplane out on the ramp it's our duty to make sure that the aircraft is ready to fly so by doing this overhead procedure which we did and we'll just make sure that everything is all everything else down here is all good to go particularly look for things like engine control switches specifically speed switches um you know thrust reversers maybe maybe the flight spoilers aren't fully in there detent want to make sure that the landing gear down is down that's extremely important that could be a really bad day for you so make sure the gear is down and locked and that the flaps are in the zero position and are matching what you see outside and all everything all, all the functionality here come down here make sure all the switches are where you want them to i would pay, pay particular attention to this area here as well let's just start at the bottom here so our park brake is on uh, that probably wouldn't be the case at this point but that's probably why the crew uh, left it without chocks in real world that wouldn't have happened but um, we'll, we'll leave that on uh, landing gear manual release is good. ADG manual release is good. Um, this is all good down here. Uh, we're not doing any checklists at this point. We're just kind of going over everything. Have a look at make sure that these switches here, so our display switches are all where you want them to. Our ADC is in the normal position and our AFCS is in position one or our, our standard position and their IRS selectors are all where you want them to. 
So at the very least, when you're coming to an aircraft that hasn't been flown in a while and it's done maintenance, um, you know, this is a very critical moment. You're doing a test flight. Uh, potentially, you know, things can go wrong and you need to be ready. So that's kind of it at this point. Um, I won't spend too much time like this any in the other videos. Just wanted to go over what we would really do in real life. We do an extra careful inspection of the aircraft externally, making sure you know all the fasteners uh, and all the panels are locked, all of those things that we need to do, which we normally do anyways, but we're just kind of making extra, extra care in that the aircraft's ready. So that's kind of it. I would also make sure, obviously, what we do is make sure all of our equipment is on board. As I mentioned uh, in previous videos, all the circuit breakers are going to check, be checked. Make sure that they're all in and flush. So there's some here, there's some down here. And as you know, there's more here. Uh, there's more down here. And where else are they? They're in the nose section. So our main battery and our APU battery, which is in the aft external uh, bay, is all good. And that the circuit breakers that are back there as well are all in. Okay, so we have completed our normal power-up checklist. We are at start checks. So this is going to be a little bit modified and maybe different from the in-sim checklist. But just go with me here. So start checks. The uh, weight and balance is archived. It's not required. We're not flying. Doors are closed. We can verify that with our cast message there. We have gear pins, so four sighted and stowed. Passports, they're checked. We don't need them, but we have them. The uh, dispatch and customs have been notified. Um, so our our wing ops is a, a ver um, knows what we're doing, and and we have fire guards in place, and we're going to make sure that this is a, a successful start of our CF-34. If if not, we'll have to put it out with some fire trucks. Um, cell phones and iPads. Uh, we have them on board. They are in airplane mode and we definitely have them up to our QRC and um, we're ready to take any action as required. Parking brake is set as you can see. Again, I like to reach down make sure physically with my hand that it is, uh, it is in fact on. Hydraulic 3A pump. All the hydraulics are on at this point. Um, beacon is coming on. Ignition, we're going to go with Bravo. And fuel pumps, left on, right on, and back to here. And uh, engine start. Okay, so with our engine start, I want to keep a few things in mind. We want to have, we want to make sure that we have um, sufficient air going to our engine. So where we're going to get that from is our bleed pressure right here. So one of the start malfunctions that you could get would be where you're accelerating to the point where it doesn't want to light off. So we're going to have basically an N2 stagnation or possibly a hung start. That's another word for it. So the, the proper word that Bombardier uses is N2 stagnation. So we could see today a hot start, N2 stagnation, no light off, interrupted start of some type, you know, whatever it may be, a low idling situation, or a start valve fails to cut off. So we're going to get some hand signals going here. We'll go with chalks out. And we're in a military base. We have fire guard around us. We have um, lots of equipment ready to go should we have any problems. I'm basically just going to be holding the brakes. Okay, and, um, so my pilot monitoring over here is all ready to go. What their job is going to be is to press the start timer. And basically, as soon as I press the, um, the start switch. So with that, we're going to go ahead with our start. So clear right says it's clear right starting right hand side so I'll just do this because we kind of have uh, too many hands not too many not enough hands on deck here we go there's the light two lights go out ignition we're looking for 20 percent positive fan and below 
120 for ITT. And raise the gate. So N2. Oil pressure or correction N2. Fuel flow. ITT. Oil pressure. 55%. I'm looking for starter cutout so there's no lights on here and we have recovery back on the uh, the bleed system and we can have a look now uh, for our recovery of our APU so our APU bleed pressure it looks like it's recovered and we're gonna go with our standard fuel pumps off at this point we're looking for pressure and pump pump pressure pump pump looks good And uh, we'll get rid of that. Come back here. Pumps back on. Looking for green lights there. Perfect. Okay, that's a stable start. So it's stable. We got um, green indications all the way up. So that's looking really good. Should we have a failure to start? This is what it's going to be indicated by. So light off of the engine is indicated by a rise in ITT. So that obviously we saw that. Normally, this is achieved within 10 seconds from the thrust lever operation. So when I move the thrust lever up, I should see ITT increasing within 10 seconds. Starter motor operation continues until automatic disengagement occurs at 55% N2. Normally, this is within 20 to 40 seconds. Or if the start is aborted by selecting the stop button. Remember, we can always press the stop button. So if we go to the overhead here, we have a stop button here. And if I want to motor the engine right now, which I could, there's no problem with that. I can just can press the start button. There's the light, there's the ignition, the two lights are out and we can have a look. So let's just say there's some reason we want to stop it. All we have to do is press stop, hold it, everything's back to normal here and you can see it is winding back down that's as simple as it is there okay so a failure to start however an ambient temperature of greater than 15 degrees celsius or 59 degrees fahrenheit so that's that's normal because we we started to turn the engine but it didn't get fast enough so we got some from failures going on there an ambient at ambient temperatures of greater than 15 degrees Celsius, the start must be aborted if the engine fails to start. In other words, no light off after 25 seconds from thrust lever movement to idle. So if we don't see it within 25 seconds after we've moved it into the idle position, we have to stop. So after 60 seconds of start operation and the engine has not reached starter cutout speed, the start should be aborted by selecting stop, exactly what we just did. At temperatures below 15 degrees, which we have today, I mentioned it to you, it's three degrees outside, the start sequence may exceed 60 seconds. It's a little bit colder, things are gonna take a, a while to go. Now, let's just review, again, that is for the hydraulic low pressure, which is normal. If if we need to, what we're going to do to um, basically with a failure to start, we're going to move the thrust lever of the starting e engine to shut off. Then we're going to disarm the ignition. If we have one engine running, which you know we have right now, it's operating properly. The inoperative engine fuel switch or the left or right bo boost pump switch light, we're going to press out. Why are we doing this? We're going to disarm the boost pump. Then we're going to check for the left or right fuel pump caution message coming on. The next part is important. We're going to dry motor until the ITT is below 120 degrees Celsius. Now, the key thing is we can only run our starter for 90 seconds. That is our limitation. So that is why this timing is so important. So that's why this timing is started. Typically, um, you know, it started 
the when, when we get stable start call basically we're going to cancel it at that point okay so that's enough chat let's make this happen hand signals clear to start number one says it's good okay here we go I'm just gonna start the timing here timing started there we go and two and one pause the fan below 120 Okay, so I have it confirmed into the idle position. We see the engine is not accelerating at this point. Something's going on. Board the start, what, the first thing we need to do is come down to, let's move this over here, come down here, abort it. So we've gone to shut off, ignition, disarm. I'll get rid of this here. So left ignition, or see the ignition just, disarm and then the next thing is going to be the left fuel pump is going to be off we should get a cast message from that there we go now we're at just about at 90 seconds so we're we want to make sure that we have below 120 degrees here well it's not going to be anything because it is dry motoring and well it didn't turn on more importantly okay so that is a um, it hasn't shut off, so we're going to do it. Press it in. It's aborted. Everything's back to the condition. So at this point, this was called the failure to start basically checklist. It, it's found in a few different locations. The one I'm reading right now is actually from the AFM, and uh, that's normal. So we got hydraulic, low pressure, and we know about the pump. So we're just going to, we have a, we, our engine, it looks like it's slowing down. There's no temperature increases. Everything's okay. And we don't have any fires. So those are all important. Now, again, with the start malfunction, we don't know what happened. We have no idea. We just know that we, uh, we did not get any increase in, in speed. So it could have been an N2 stagnation. It could have been some other problem. But basically, it was an interrupted start, and, and that's what we are going to do. So our immediate actions were to power lever to shut off and the move into the failure to start checklist, which is what I was reading from. Again, the checklist was thrust lever of starting engine, select to shut off, ignition, disarm. If one engine is operating, which it is, inoperative engine fuel, left or right boost pump, switch light, press out this will disarm the boost pump then we check the left and right fuel pump caution matches messages on which it is then we dry motor until itt is below 120 degrees celsius maximum 90 seconds and we observe limitations so that is all good that is complete so what we're going to do now is shut the other engine down and call maintenance at this point so we'll just conduct a shutdown at this point Okay, let's shut down engine number two. There we go. So not a big deal there. There's no any indications, but what we're going to do is come up to the overhead here, turn that fuel pump off, and we are at the point where we're going to just talk about what happened. So it looks like we had some type, type of uh, N2 stagnation. That's why I discontinued the start and we followed our start malfunction uh, checklist and then we went into the basically what we call the white pages and i'll display our start malfunction information up on the screen here probably a couple times and then i will show you the procedures that are required for the white page normal procedures failure to start checklist okay so at this point what we're going to do is we're going to call our base operations and our ma maintenance operations and have a chat and they're going to send maintenance out here and have a look at the aircraft engine and basically we're going to terminate this uh this flight at this point and um so i want to thank you this is a just a quick 
um, beginning of a series of looking at different types of QRH issues and uh, engine starting malfunctions. Thank you very much. Rob Hammer out. Have a great day. Please join me in my next video, which is going to be in the Challenger 650 by Aerodynamics CC144D, the RCAF. We're going to be Miramar, California with another engine-related issue. See you real soon.